Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Al Fitzpain, Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Recovery, Reemployment, and Reimagining Work. I also want to thank the Aspen Financial Security Program for being our co host today. Today's event is the 10th and final installment in a series that looks at the research, knowledge, and policies that can help employers, policymakers, and others design solutions that respond to the immediate effects of the pandemic, but also address the structural challenges needed for long-term stability. If you haven't had a chance to join the previous events, I encourage you to go to the Financial Security Program's website, where they're available for viewing. Today's event was developed as part of the Global Inclusive Growth Partnership, a collaboration between the Aspen Institute and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. We're fortunate to have Shamina Singh with us to kick off today's discussion. Shamina is the founder and president of the Center for Inclusive Growth, the philanthropic hub of MasterCard. Shamina's career has spanned the public and private sectors, including senior roles in the White House and Congress, as well as with Nike and Cities Global Community Development Group. I mention this because the issues we're discussing today required thinking not just from policymakers or from business, but across sectors to develop solutions to build an inclusive future of work. Thank you, Shamina, for your partnership and for joining us today. Thanks, Al, and thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining this uh, call. Um, on, I think what is uh, one of the most important topics that we can be speaking about today. Um, as Al mentioned, the, Glo the Global Inclusive Growth Partnership is a collaboration between the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth and the Aspen Institute. Um, over the course of five years and across five uh, work streams, our collaboration will produce knowledge, insights, and convenings that highlight and dissect the stark economic inequalities at home and abroad and chart pathways forward for not only corporations, but policymakers and community leaders alike to implement comprehensive change within their sectors that address these challenges. Um, you know, at the Center for Inclusive Growth, I think it's important to point out that our work in this area has really focused on people-centric, tech-enabled solutions that empower workers to control and manage their benefits, regardless of where they live, who they work for, or how they work. And this has meant a journey for us that not only combined um, innovation, but also, as you'll hear from our next speaker, policy leadership. Um, but the truth is innovation isn't waiting um, for any of us. From companies like Catch uh, to Alia to Merit America, Opportunity at Work, it's happening. We need to use these platforms and these opportunities to get together to galvanize action, to combine forces, to lead these um, calls with a sense of what we do next, if not a specific plan, at least the notions of a partnership and a plan to move forward. Um, the work is in motion, and the future of work, as we all know, is now. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our uh, next speaker, our keynote speaker, uh, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt. Um, Rochester, Lisa Blunt Rochester, who represents Delaware in the U.S. House of Representatives. In addition to her role as Assistant Whip for House Leadership, she serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and also founded the bipartisan House Future of Work Caucus earlier this year. Prior to her election to Congress, Congressman Blunt Rochester served in a number of key roles for the state of Delaware, including Secretary of Labor and as the CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League. She became involved with the Aspen Institute through her role on the Future Work Initiative National Advisory Council. Due to the congressional calendar, the Congresswoman recently pre-recorded this conversation with Alfred Payne in order to join us in join us virtually today. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for that introduction. Again, we're honored to be joined by Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. She is a leading congressional voice on future of work issues and recently co-founded the House Future of Work Caucus, which we'll hopefully have a chance to hear about uh, shortly. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Al, and thank you for all that you do to advance the future of work. 
So we wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and I want to start with COVID-19 and it's obviously upended the labor market and fundamentally changed the conversation around the future of work. Um, we now better have a, a better understanding about essential workers, remote work and learning have become more than just trends and we're having to confront the weaknesses of our safety net, especially as it relates to the health and economic impacts on communities of color. And these are just a few of the changes that the pandemic has brought our way. So, but for you, how has COVID-19 changed the conversation around the future of work and, and how do we need to prepare for it? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm glad you're even having this conversation. Um, as you know, uh, when I uh, came to Congress three years ago, this was something that I started noticing in conversations and intersection, but that there was no real coherent vision or strategy or preparation as a country. And so at that time, um, our assumption was really based on technology, automation, will this displace people, disruption. We had all these conversations from that perspective, not envisioning that a pandemic would really be the thing that has both pushed us to the future of work as well as exposed uh, inequities that already existed in, in our country and the fraying of the social contract. And so um, to me, COVID-19 has really, as I said, both shined a light and exposed those inequities, but at the same time, it has also made us um, like really put into practice the things that have been talked about for decades. I mean, we've been talking about distance learning for decades. We've been talking about teleworking, telemedicine. One of my colleagues in Congress, one of my Republican colleagues said something like, prior to COVID-19, about there was about a 13% penetration in tele telehealth and telemedicine, and that afterwards it was, you know, over 80%. And so it actually forced us, because of this pandemic, to think differently. I think on the inequities piece of it, um, what it has shown is that um, whether it is education and training opportunities, whether it is access to um, high wage jobs, I mean, we've seen the middle class shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, um, whether it is focusing on those in demand areas that we should be focusing our, our resources, our attention, and even directing not just young people, but those of us who transition at later parts of life, um, it has really shined a light. And so um, I think now more than ever, um, the, the future of work is the, as, as I've heard it said, the now of work, and that we need to be making sure that we have an opportunity, even with the title of this, this session, to reimagine what work could look like yeah. instead of it just happening to us. Yeah, and I want to pick up, you mentioned the uh, inequities and the light that COVID-19 has shown on those and you know, the murder of George Floyd um, and the focus on racial justice um, has done that as well. Um, and in particular highlighted income and wealth disparities between black and white workers in today's economy. Black workers have higher unemployment rates, are more disproportionately represented in, in low wage jobs. And now we have half of the adult, uh, adult black population that's not in the labor force. And you mentioned the now of work. So I, I wanna ask you, what should Congress, you're a leader in Congress um, and other important stakeholders and institutions, um, and employers come to mind, what should they be doing now to address these disparities in the, co in the context of the, the future of work conversation? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, it was interesting that COVID-19, while initially I think people were just thinking of it as a pandemic that affected everybody, we started seeing that if you had underlying health conditions, you were disproportionately likely to con not only contract COVID, but die from it. And so you would have places in our country where African-Americans were 20% of the population, but 70% of the mortality rate. Um, you would look at the, the jobs that essential workers had, and they were many of the jobs that, um, you know, whether it's, you know, d delivering groceries, whether it's driving a bus, um, these were uh, frontline healthcare workers and public safety. These were jobs that many African-Americans held and couldn't say, hey, I'm just going to telework. 
you, if that wasn't an, an option. And so um, as members of Congress, I mean, beyond the fact that it was disproportionately impacting and you look at like, you start looking at other issues in terms of the institutional and structural racism that are a part of our country. So for example, um, implicit bias in healthcare. Somebody goes to a hospital who's black and this, there were countless stories of people being turned away and then going home and dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, someone saying, well, you have asthma, you have diabetes, you have heart condition. I live near a toxic waste uh, site. Um, I, uh, so therefore I might have asthma. I am in a food desert. Therefore, I don't have clean, you know, fresh green groceries to, to, to partake of. And so these like structural things that people didn't make the connections on now come to the fore. So then you add into that your education system where we have disparity and, and inequities in funding in terms of schools. You look at who are the teachers and the, the salaries that they get. And it just becomes a perfect storm. And so what was interesting about COVID is that, again, it made Congress even say, we have to target our resources. So if we're gonna pass a multi-trillion dollar bill, for example, the PPP program for the Paycheck Protection Program for those small businesses, who's really getting the dollars? Are we getting it to those small and minority owned businesses that actually do contribute to the economy. Um, you take a look at programs like SNAP. Are we expanding that during this period when we really need it? And I think what was interesting was to see people, back to the social contract, people who voted on things that they never would have voted on in normal circumstances, like paid, paid sick leave, were forced to say, in order for these essential workers to stay essential, in order for us to um, all thrive and survive during this really incredible health challenge and crisis, we're gonna have to do some things we've never done before. So Congress voted on things that they never would have come together on because we had to, we yeah. had to. And let me ask, I mean, Congress moved quickly, they moved robustly, and now there's a big debate about what comes next? And you've just highlighted all these really important needs and um, uh, kind of urgent um, um, requests that people have to be able to kind of withstand uh, the pandemic and um, deal with the economy as it is um, right now. Where you you're uh, you represent the entire state of Delaware. You're on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, you're a member of the Congressional Black Caucus and the New Dems. Where do you want to kind of put your energy? Where are you focused in terms of trying to address the broad sweep of needs that are coming before members of Congress today? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, as you mentioned, I'm both in the New Dems, which is the business friendly, but I'm also in the Progressive Caucus as well as the Women's Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus. And so I do see all of these um, intersections. And, you know, uh, one of the things I didn't mention was the expansion of unemployment for gig economy workers. See, again, this was stuff that we really didn't, our social safety net didn't account for the changes that have already happened. And I think as we move forward, um, I've been saying to people in the, in, I, in the face of the, 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 just the, the, the pain and the angst and the anguish that has arisen from a pandemic on top of a racial pandemic, that we have to individually hold up a mirror to ourselves and say, what can I do more? What can I do differently right now? Not just for my health and well-being, but for the democracy of our, our, our country and for the health and well-being even of our economy and our relationships. What can I do and what can we do collectively? And so business community, you know, there are specific things that, um, you know, it's not enough to give people off Juneteenth. I can't eat Juneteenth. I can't put my kids through college based on a holiday. But what would make a difference is if we look at the opportunities within your company for people to grow 
and to be able to have the skills, the building of those vital skills so that I could get the, the higher level job, so that I could compete. What would help is if leadership, as well as, the, as, well as everyone, did understand implicit bias. What would help is if people did, and this is in the business, in the faith community, in, in research and in institutions, looking at, hey, I'm looking around, are there, is there, are there any black people in here? Even something as basic as opening your eyes and being aware and having conversations with people that you typically, I call them, you know, it's like getting comfortable with uncomfortable conversations. From, from Congress's perspective, we've had to look at the fact that a, an issue like universal benefits, like, I mean, um, you know, UBI, the universal basic income, that people would have laughed about like months ago. Well, we just gave everybody a stimulus check. You know, we just expanded those kind of safety nets that people needed. And what I just, I read a New York Times article uh, today that basically said that our poverty level, you would think we would be, like poverty would be going up because of this current situation. But because of the bold and decisive action that we took, that was not incremental, not around the edges, the poverty level actually decreased some. Mm. My concern is we're a potentially about to see, we're already seeing spikes. We, we, we've decided to open up the economy and people are trying to do it in smart ways, but we're already seeing spikes. Yeah. What are we doing to prepare for that? Yeah, let's um, I, I could go into a whole like specifics in terms of like how we can target our money, how we can work with HBCUs, um, uh, what benefits should continue to be broadened and expanded, not not contracted, yeah. in a new in a new economy as we reimagine. Um, there's me, lots to do, um, let me, and even an infrastructure bill presents opportunities for us. Where are we going with infrastructure? Well, let me, that's a, a good, maybe last question for, for you. And, um, you know, this question of um, how do we move from recovery to rebuilding? Um, we have over 40 million people who have had to file for unemployment. Many of them probably won't be able to return to their prior job. You mentioned the, you know, the important role of education and training in terms of helping people develop skills and opportunities. Obviously, that's not the whole answer, but it's a part of part of the answer. And so, um, how are you thinking about the role of education and training in terms of helping people adjust to the shock of what's happening in our labor market today? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I know that um, the uh, Education and Labor Committee has put forward a bill called Relaunching America's Workforce Act. Um, that that bill really kind of reinvests more dollars in some of the existing um, infrastructure that we have, whether it's focusing on community colleges, whether it's focusing on um, career and technical education, and making sure it's tied to like the demands for what we need right now. Um, but I do think there's sort of long-term and short-term as it pertains to, to education and kids. I mean, I, broadband internet, what we have seen is that it is, as Jim Clyburn says, it's the new electricity. If you don't, ha we know, if you don't have that, um, that's going to be a challenge for kids being educated. The Wi-Fi, the internet, the, the, the equipment, um, the career pathways, you know, there are some schools and some institutions that really get it and connect it and are making sure that that's where, the, where, where we go. And then just even the equity and funding. Um, from the adult side, I mentioned the relaunching act, but I feel like conversations like this are going to be vital in terms of informing policymakers and legislators like myself. Um, we need this kind of dialogue to help reimagine because that's one of the reasons we created the caucus, the Future of Work caucus. It's a bipartisan caucus, and the goal was to say we can't do it, Democrats and Republicans and independents. We have to do this reimagining together. And it's going to take every single one of us, including labor unions in the chamber. And it's going to take all of us to come out with what we want the world to be. And then the political will 
to make it make it so. Yeah, and I think that's probably the perfect place to end uh, understanding the challenge in front of you. Congresswoman, thank you so much as always for you. your thoughts um, and your uh, wisdom on these issues. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, as always, you've given us a lot to think about uh, and reasons to be hopeful um, about be the hopeful. future of work. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we look forward to our paths crossing soon. Thanks to the panel and thanks to the Aspen Institute and everybody who is engaged in building a better and brighter future. Thanks. Okay, now we'll turn to Shelley Stewart from the Future of Work Initiative to lead our panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shelley Stewart, the Associate Director of Research with the Future of Work Initiative. Uh, and we are fortunate to be joined today by three leaders addressing challenging issues facing our economy today. So I'll ask that our three panelists turn on their cameras now. Excellent. Uh, so Dr. Iforma Ajunwa is a sociologist and legal scholar, currently Associate Professor of Labor and Employment Law at Cornell University's ILR School. Uh, she examines the intersection of law, technology, and work, uh, and has written on wearable technologies, digital surveillance, uh, and workplace discrimination. And she's the author of the forthcoming book, The Quantified Worker, Law and Technology in the Modern Workplace. So I'm excited for that one to come out. Uh, Dr. Anmal Chada, also a sociologist, is a research director of the Equitable Futures Lab at the Institute for the Future. Uh, he's also coordinating the efforts of California's Future of Work Commission, which was established by Governor Newsom last year. His background bridges research and policy focusing on addressing economic and racial inequality and job quality. And last but not least, Rachel Lauder is the Executive Director of Working Washington, a workers organization in Washington State that advocates for fair working conditions uh, and also of the Fair Work Center, a legal clinic for workers in Seattle. Uh, Working Washington was behind Seattle's first in the nation $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, Rachel has a legal background and worked in the mayor's office in New York City before joining Working Washington. Uh, so we'll reserve time for some audience questions at the end of this discussion. And so for all of you watching from afar, if you have a question, please please type it into the question field, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, and put those in any time during the panel, and then we'll turn to them uh, towards the end. To start things off, I have a question for all of you to answer. Uh, that is, from your perspective and kind of your areas of expertise, what are some of the most pressing challenges that we're facing regarding work during the pandemic and as we look forward towards the recovery? Uh, Dr. Ajunwa, would you like to get us started? Uh, yes, um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to start. And and first I wanna say thank you so much to the Aspen Institute for, for this invitation. I'm happy to be here and happy to share my, uh, my work and my expertise. Um, so in regards to the most, uh, I would say pressing ch challenge for the return to work, uh, I think it's obviously the health aspect, how you manage workers returning to work, uh, some of whom might have health issues or some of whom might be more vulnerable uh, in terms of uh, contracting the virus. Um, so I think uh, many workplaces will be grappling with coming up with a plan, right, where they can effectively uh, institute social distancing, for example, and also where they can effectively provide the reasonable accommodations that are required by law under the ADA. So the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, mandates that uh, employers do give a, a reasonable accommodations uh, to employees who might be more vulnerable or who might actually have already contracted COVID. Um, so I think this is going to be a pressing challenge uh, for workplaces in the future uh, as they try to reintegrate workers back into the workplace. Okay, let's turn it to you on Mal for your, your thoughts on most pressing challenges. Sure, I think, you know, I think it's 
it goes without saying that before the pandemic, we, we were already witnessing the growing inequality among workers um, that have been going on for decades and had really been entrenched for a long time as a result of a long series of processes and, and factors. And I think right now, what should be at the front of our mind is, is a real concern with, with how this how uh, this will continue to play out in the context of this pandemic. I think just recently the Fed released its annual survey of household and economic decision making, and this year they were able to include a, a supplement um, to the survey in April, at the, early on in the pandemic, around and asking questions around work. And the data there is really striking and showing this really stark divide between you know, one group of workers who's able to work from home, who's able to sort of continue almost inter uninterrupted, continue to receive their, their salaries and their incomes, um, and, and at the same time, essentially saving a lot of that money, right, because so much of the economy is shut down. Um, so in a, in a way, maybe even growing their assets or savings or the financial resources, while you have another group of workers who's completely unable to, to access, you know, work from home, who work primarily in, in service sectors and retail and hospitality and food service and restaurants, who had income interruptions, um, Notwithstanding whatever you know, so some of the policy assistance that was put on the the relief bills, um, and I think there is a real threat of a very serious bifurcation now between these two groups of workers. Um, again, it, it builds on this long running trend that we had seen before, but we could be seeing something like the emergence of a really entrenched, almost a caste system between these two groups of workers that I think should be very concerning to all of us. Thank you. And Rachel? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you for including me in our work in this conversation. It's really great to see community-based organizations represented in this conversation. Um, I just I want to say that I think it's difficult to overstate the, the devastation of the economic crisis right now and how much the safety, our safety net and income support systems have failed to meet the moment. Um, economic security is deep, deeply tied to public health. If people are not making money or don't have access to income support, they're going to go back to work. So, for example, we've heard a lot from folks who are starting to take on gig work because they can't get unemployment insurance benefits due to either a failure of the system or historical and structural exclusions from unemployment insurance. So all this risk is being shifted onto workers. Um, the other big thing I worry about a lot is folks increasingly relying on precarious gig work um, to supplement our anemic safety net. So in the with the decline of service sector jobs, we're seeing more growth in gig delivery jobs. And what does that mean for the economy? Is that shift permanent? If this industry doesn't have standards associated with it, these are you know, low paying jobs, what is that gonna mean for the service sector long-term? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and I wanted to add to Ann Mall's point about the, um, you know, the bifurcation on creation of classes, you know, within the workplace, um, because I think that actually touches upon also racial in inequity um, that is, I think, going to be further exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, just to give some stats, um, less than one in five um, Black Americans are able to work from home. And when it comes to Latinx, um, it's actually only about one in six that are able to work from home. Um, so you now see this divide, right, of people who can work comfortably from home and still receive their salary and still be able to uh, contribute to the economy, you know, still be able to provide for their families, and then people who just cannot work from home and as a result are uh, either forced out of the workplace uh, because of restrictions or are forced to be on the front line of the pandemic and therefore will contract the virus at higher rates. Um, so that is an issue that I think as a society we do have to think about. Um, and of course, I think there are definitely certainly many ways we can mitigate the cost to those people who can't work from home. Uh, this includes things like you know, providing proper personal protective equipment, PPE, for frontline workers. And, you know, frontline workers don't mean just people who are in hospitals, right? It's not just the nurses, the doctors, uh, the janitors, um, the nursing assistants. It's also the grocery, uh, you know, grocery clerks. It's the people who are bagging groceries. 
Um, it's it's the people who are manning all the uh, you know institutions that we need for our daily lives to run. Um, and we shouldn't overlook those people. We should still make sure that we're providing protections for those people. Yeah, the challenges that you all raise sort of weave together in, in really nuanced and more obvious ways with the, the health concerns that are right in front of us, the economic inequality as we go into a deepening crisis, uh, and the, the inadequate safety net that should should be able to catch people when they're in need, but is unable to sort of in, in the best of times, much less in a, a devastating moment like this. And then all of that is in the context of, of deep structural racism. Um, and again, the, the economic inequality that we faced for far too long. Uh, thinking a bit about looking towards recovery, looking towards reemployment. Um, what what needs to happen before people can return to work safely? Um, and in the case of essential and frontline workers who are still reporting to work every day, what changes would need to happen to make the workplace safe? Uh, for this, we can start uh, with Rachel. Sure. I, you know, I have a, a long list of, of you know dreams and wishes about what needs to happen. I think that there's. We really do need to figure out our unemployment insurance system. We need to address historical exclusions from it, including undocumented workers and independent contractors. Like I said before, you know, people will go back to work if they do not have another source of income. And so it's really critical that we figure out how to supplement people's pay. Um, we need way more universal paid leave, paid sick and safe time. We need hazard pay or premium pay to sort of acknowledge um, and compensate for the risk that these essential workers have been taking on. I think we need new scheduling protections, you know, real concern about what's happening for families and working parents. You know, if school's going back part time, what are we going to do for workers who have to, you know, have childcare responsibilities? And then we've been thinking a lot about what is the system of unemployment insurance that makes sense? Is, that very quickly distributes cash to folks, you know, who will spend it in our communities and bolster the economy. You know, and how do we eliminate all these barriers to actually getting that cash? So, you know, some sort of dream unemployment insurance no fault system, right? You know, something that really just gets cash to people quickly so they can, um, you know, so they can support themselves. And Anma, what about you? What do you see needing to, to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think so. My orientation, I think, for the recovery is a little bit is probably a bit farther out. I think looking over a longer sequence of time, and we're looking at years, really. I think there we you know that there's huge numbers of people without you know they're unemployed or jobless or are now not in the labor market. Um, and I think there is a qualitative difference between having a lot of people without jobs and having the actual employers start to disappear. Right or start to close down the establishments, which is, I think is what we're you know, are you know we're already beginning to see that, and we're going to continue to see that. So it's not just about absorbing people back into the labor market, but when the actual employers are gone, that's a qualitatively different scenario with an enormous number of people without jobs. And I think it may be instructive to look back at the last time we saw something like this. And I think <clears throat> to me the obvious parallel, or maybe the it's not necessarily a parallel, but there's uh, the last time we saw something like this was maybe with deindustrialization and the widespread loss of manufacturing jobs. Um, and I think what we saw there was one that the, that the loss of manufacturing jobs was not was was not evenly distributed or evenly felt. It, it took a toll, especially um, severely, on urban black communities. And um, I think it's also important to see not just the economic effects, but you know there's a really important influential book by William Julius Wilson about this specifically, and it's called When Work Disappears, right? And so what he found the, looked at the sociological implications of this economic shift. And what he found was that you had uh, this, this job loss was concentrated spatially in certain neighborhoods, and that uh, you ended up with neighborhoods which lar with large numbers of people without jobs. And that, that being in a neighborhood with, uh, whether you yourself have a job or, or, or not, um, being in a neighborhood where many other people with, or don't have jobs is very different than being in a neighborhood where, where most of the people continue to have jobs. Um, 
and that it creates a whole cycle of, of spatial concentration and, and reinforces disadvantages. And then just being a child growing up in that neighborhood, being in two different neighborhoods is so different. And that then leads to what we see today with a lot of the, the research that Raj Shetty has been doing and, and been, a lot of, been getting a lot of attention for. But that really comes out of that earlier work, looking at the sociological implications of this disappearance of work. And I think that that's something I don't know exactly what, what, what this is going to look like, but we know that it's going to it's not just a matter of X million people without jobs, that there's going to be real serious sociological implications beyond just the, the sheer number of people without jobs. And whether that's, we know that obviously there will be some sort of spatial concentration as well. That's not going to be even low wage workers tend to live in lower income neighborhoods around each other. So you'll have similar, we may have similar things where, you, where we have neighborhoods with large numbers of people without jobs with disappearing income and increasingly precarious work. Um, and so I think that that uh, will can set off another course of, of reinforcing disadvantage that, you know, from deindustrialization, we've been seeing this now for, for generate the, the, the disadvantage being perpetuated throughout generations. And I think it's, it'll be crucial not to just focus on the acute impacts of this pandemic, but to start to look forward ahead to the coming years as well. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, to pick up that thread uh, from Enmal's um, uh, comments, um, you know, if, if, if some of you read the New York Times today, you noticed that there was a story about how um, what hospital you go to um, is very um, indicative of whether you would survive COVID or whether you would even develop complications um, because of the kind of care you would be able to receive. Um, and this really speaks to the inequality we have in American society in terms of neighborhoods and in terms of, you know, residential segregation such that, you know, people in, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic neighborhoods have had their disadvantages really um, compounded by this pandemic. Um, so I do think, you know, as we're thinking of recovery, um, you know, the government, um, and this can be state government, this can be federal government, could think about how to shore up resources uh, in these types of neighborhoods, right? Whether it's, you know, shoring up resources for the hospitals, um, whether it's shoring up uh, more aid for families as we go through these, uh, this crisis, uh, but just really making sure that those families who are already behind don't fall further behind because of this crisis. Um, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, going back to Rachel's point, you know, I'm glad she, measured, she mentioned uh, hazard pay because I think this is really uh, uh, an issue of fairness and something that we do have to think about in terms of um, essential workers and frontline workers. Um, but I also, I think we do also want to maybe reintroduce the conversation around a universal basic income. Right, because if people are out of work uh, through no fault of their own, because the employer has left, right, then you know we do as a society want to find a way to keep those people afloat, at least until the crisis is over. So I think this could be a time to reintroduce that conversation on universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for starting to turn the conversation to some solutions and some ideas. Uh, to, to solve some of these very pressing challenges. Uh, Anmal, I'd like to turn to you and ask similarly, uh, what are some of the policies that you see that may be effective in addressing these widening economic inequalities and the, the spatial distribution of inequality that we're seeing? Yeah, no, that's a tough one. And I think that's, that's one that we've been trying to wrestle with for a long time. I think in the current crisis, I think it's, it's um, I think it'll be important and interesting to, to start considering in a very serious way something like a federal jobs program or efforts around po federal policy around jobs. Because again, if you have the official unemployment rate topping 15% consistently, um, and we know that's, that doesn't actually act, uh, accurately um, cover uh, who's actually disconnected from the labor market or jobless, that you need to have some pretty serious intervention there, um, and that the, the markets alone aren't going to, the labor market alone isn't going to be able to correct for that very quickly. I think an important thing that came up very briefly earlier, I think, um, I think Rachel mentioned around um, undocumented workers, right? I think 
Um, California was able to put a little bit of support for undocumented workers in some of the early relief bills. Um, and I think that's, that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but I think that's obviously the most vulnerable um, segment of our labor, of our labor force. And, um, and there's a broader economic argument, of course, where, you know, uh, just making sure that the people who are working or who have been working are continuing to able to support their families and just survive during these times. But I think that, um, you know, as we, as we focus on, you know, the people who need the help the most, I think that's, that's a group that I think it'll be really interesting to see how those conversations play out around like deservingness and, and I think plays an important part in, in, in targeting some of those programs as well. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'll just remind our listeners and viewers that you can go ahead and be entering your questions because we'll be turning to those soon. Uh, but before we get there, uh, Rachel, I wanted to ask you about the role that workers have uh, and, and the importance of building worker power uh, in addressing these challenges that we're talking about. Sure, yeah. Our theory of change really is that the only way that we're gonna make any of this happen in work is if uh, workers, are at the center and lead this conversation and um, that requires organizing workers and organizing workers is expensive it takes time um, but it's sort of critical to ensuring that we have both lasting policy change that we hold our decision makers accountable and that you know those rights feel real to folks um, so we just passed in seattle two really exciting laws related to the gig economy um, a paid sick and safe time law that we think is the first law in the country that's sort of specifically designed for gig workers to have paid sick leave and a hazard pay law for app-based food delivery workers, food and grocery delivery workers. And that wouldn't have happened without us organizing gig workers, right? I mean, we organize and talk to thousands of gig workers and we do it digitally, you know, we find folks online, but then we talk to them one-on-one -on -one, and now obviously all digitally. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to make those policy changes without those folks, those worker leaders showing up, testifying before the city council, talking to their elected officials and advocating for change. And so it's both making new laws and pushing the conversation, but then it's thinking about, you know, what is this, what do you know, new forms of worker voice look like? Standards boards, you know, we have a standards board in Seattle uh, and for domestic workers, and that's allowed us to really surface like what are the issues related to COVID right now like what are some of the enforcement issues health and safety issues you know creating permanent structures where workers can have more voice feels really critical to any of this work yeah it's exciting to hear about some of the on the ground changes that that are happening and addressing some of the those challenges that we opened with uh Iforma, i wanted to turn to you to ask about uh, workplace technology which is something that you've thought more about possibly than, than anyone else. Uh, and, and especially the relationship between workplace technologies, those we might be seeing introduced to help enforce social distancing, uh, and their relationship to inequality uh, and, and how they may intersect with some of the, the inequality related challenges. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much for the question. So I've, I've written about, you know, uh, workplace uh, surveillance of workers. Uh, the title of that paper is Limitless Worker Surveillance. Um, and I've also written about wearable tech in the workplace, and that's uh, looking at algorithms at work is that title. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, it is completely reasonable for employers to want to um, you know, surveil workers to prevent COVID uh, spreading in the workplace. This is completely reasonable. This is in line with public health, uh, you know, policies. I think the issue is, you know, what types of technologies are used to effectuate that uh, type of, uh, you know, um, worker surveillance and also how the data from those technologies are treated. So currently in the United States, there are really aren't many laws protecting workers in terms of how much data can be collected from workers and also how that data can be used. As I've written for uh, the Harvard Business uh, Review, a lot of worker data actually ends up getting sold uh, once it's collected without even the knowledge or consent of the worker. And I think this actually is quite a problem, particularly when you now have sensitive health data involved. So I think for companies who are 
you know, undertaking to use uh, several types of technologies to effectuate social distancing or measuring temperatures of workers and things like that. I think those were, uh, companies really do want to come up with an ethical plan, right? Because even absent, you know, federal regulations, um, companies should, I think, observe ethical uh, protocol should observe ethical guidelines in how they are collecting data from workers and how they're protecting that data and also how that data might be used. So I think it could become problematic when data that is co collected under the guise of public health is then used for discrimination, right? So if it then becomes uh, that you know, workers who have contracted COVID are permanently barred from the workplace, um, that could be a problem, right? Or if certain ethnicities are deemed to be higher risk because of their higher risk uh, rates of um, infection, and then also are barred from the workplace because of this, this is also problematic. So I think mm -hmm. with any technology that's being adopted, each company should really have an ethical plan, an ethical guideline for how they will be using that technology. Yeah, and and sounds like we need to think about any of these potential solutions to one set of problems in the context of everything else that's happening. Mm -hmm. So in the context of the, the deep inequality that we see, we need to consider how anything new, not just accounts for that inequality, but may be able to be used to, to fight against it as well. Uh, we're going to turn to a few audience questions, uh, and this is for Anma. Uh, in addition to the uh, in addition to the idea of a federal jobs program, have you seen any exemplary city or state level efforts uh, focused on high wage work in a time of high unemployment? Mm -hmm. and we have a few state and local policymakers watching. Sure, I think there, that's a great question, and I think there's you know, we've talked about the, the federal jobs program, uh, but there's also no reason that you couldn't have something similar at a, at, with, with state government or local governments or county governments doing something similar. Um, but I, I do think that, that there, it's, it's, it's an important question, and, and I think the, um, the context for it is, right, so even before the, 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 the pandemic, what we saw was this, what I think was a real crisis in job quality. Um, and um, expansion of low wage work, the real prevalence of low low paying jobs, so that the the jobs that actually exist in the labor market really define the opportunities that are available to workers. And so, and, and it's not just an, an issue of workers being able to skill up or increase their training to access jobs, because a lot of those middle wage or middle skill jobs were disappearing, right? Um, and so, I think the being able to get at the job quality question in a lot of ways is about policy um, and, and really raising standards across the labor market, raising the floors. Um, and this is a lot of the work that Rachel has been leading in, in Washington. Um, and, and I think actually Rachel would have, have great examples as well um, for specific local and state responses. But I think having a concerted policy response to actually improve job quality and not leave it just to, to, to whatever jobs currently exist in the labor market, but actually improve the jobs that exist and improve the opportunities that are available to workers. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're receiving a few questions about training workers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and to what extent should we be thinking about training programs for those who are currently unemployed? Uh, and, and to the extent that we are thinking about it, how can it happen safely during the pandemic? Uh, so before my you nodding, would you like to, to take that one first? Yeah, um, yeah, I think actually that's a really great question. I mean, the issue of really reskilling, right, is one that is, or upskilling workers, right, is one that has actually been um, on the radar of, I think, for, more, for most future of work scholars for quite some time. Um, so I think actually the, this pandemic could present an opportunity, even in the midst of its disadvantages, um, you know, for workers to now have some time um, to take courses online, for example, 
could be one way that workers could learn new skills and be able to really break into new industries um, different from the ones that they were previously in. So I, I do think there could be an opportunity here and it could be one that actually, frankly, is spearheaded by a federal program, right? Offering free online programs. Um, it could also be uh, more driven by foundations or philanthropic efforts. Um, running these sort of online programs that could really train workers and upskill them or reskill them for different industries. Yeah. Thank you. Rita or Anmal, did you want to weigh in on training? Yeah, I could just say really briefly, I think the the it's the training question, I think it's a, it's important to think about what that looks like in this in the current context. Um, at the same time, we have, you know, in the labor market, we, the training and the skills approach really focuses on the supply side, the supply of workers and what, how to improve their skills and, and, and their productivity so they can access better jobs or better wages. Um, but again, we have, there's a whole demand side that, that's really in crisis right now. And I think I would just maybe put just a tiny word of caution that, that we're not going to be able to skill our way out of this problem or train our way out of this problem. The, the scale and the magnitude of, of what's going on right now in the labor market is so immense that it's it's not fundamentally a lack of skills, but I think it's at the same time, it's important to think about what the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I agree with them all. And I would just say, you know, any training or skill you know, skill development for me, it's, it's just like, how are people getting paid while they're doing it, right? Just really thinking about income support during all of this, because like, I just, I think that we are under-recognizing how much pain people are experiencing right now um, with these job losses, right? Like it can be, it feels overwhelming because the numbers are so big, but you know, these are real people, our family, our friends, and our community. And so, you know, right. offering up training, skill development opportunities are great, but it's like, where's the money behind it for folks right now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and a question for Rachel. Uh, we have a question from a communications professional who shared her experience as a consultant and the idea of risk getting shifted on to contractors in our labor market. Uh, and you've spoken about gig platforms, but what could be done to support contract workers who are having hours and jobs cut by employers right now? So, I mean, you know, there's many different layers of independent contractors, right? Where there's lots of different kinds of independent contractors in different industries, right? So there's lots of things that are, um, you know, temp workers, uh, sort of more what we could consider more traditional independent contractors, gig workers, you know, I think different things are happening in different subsector, subsets of this industry. So for example, in gig work, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers have seen huge, huge reduction in hours because people are not getting, you know, not taking ride sharing, you know, not using ride sharing apps. And so those folks have been trying to get unemployment insurance and it's been a huge problem, right? So thinking about the historical exclusions of uh, unemployment insurance for independent contractors is a big, I think one of the big fights that's gonna have to happen in the next year. Um, and we, we address some of that on the federal level, but we have to make sure that we sort of continue that and through the states make permanent change in our system so that gig workers and independent contractors have access to UI. I think that's one of the you know, big ones. But in other subsets of the gig economy, for example, in food and grocery delivery, people, you know, more and more people are entering that market because those jobs are available, right? These are the folks who have been delivering us all of our food for the last four or five months. So there's a boom there, but what we're hearing from our workers is that pay is going down because so many folks are going onto those apps and there are no minimum standards for pay. Uh, on those apps because they're considered independent contractors. So another thing, you know, we're really thinking about is how do you uh, create permanent pay standards, you know, and permanent standards broadly for the industry to protect these workers. Yeah. And as we get towards the top of the hour, a closing question for each of you. If we think about work five years from now, uh, how might it be different for the better. Uh, we've talked a lot about challenges, inequalities, and problems, but, but if we think optimistically towards the future, how might it be different? And what is one policy priority that may be able to get us there? So, Anna, let's start with you. 
Sure, I think this is a great question, and I think you're exactly right that there's the challenges can seem so um, overwhelming. So I think it's important to to also look um, what the see what opportunities there are now, and I think there's um, there may be a really valuable opportunity opening around this concept or idea of essential workers. Uh, this is enter now into so this is 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 this is really common language now, and people have a sense of what that means and who's included in that and are expressing their appreciation, you know, for essential workers. And I think there may be an opportunity to, uh, you know, looking five years down the, down, down the line to where right now, as has already been mentioned, essential workers include a lot of low wage workers, a lot of low paid workers. We also know that these are jobs that are going to be growing, especially in care work. Um, and, and, and other jobs, but face a lot of challenges, not just in wages, but also in terms of the precarity of the work, the um, break, you know, the the lack of traditional employment relationships, the lack of basic em employment protections for a lot of this work. And I, my hope is that that we that this focus and uh, you know appreciation for essential workers and essential work gets translated into actual policy changes that improves the conditions of that work. That that said, that that won't happen by itself. That has to actually be again translated into to meaningful action. You know, beyond the you know the celebrations every evening for essential workers, which I think is great. Uh, but it does need to, on its own, won't necessarily result in policy change without without deliberate, explicit action. Mm -hmm. Rachel, yeah, I I agree with that. I you know I think that. I hate to say it, you know, we've been reflecting a lot about, you know, as a workers' rights organization, how we haven't been focusing on the unemployment insurance system and income support broadly and its relationship to work and, you know, and good paying jobs. And so I think I'm hoping that, you know, this crisis helps the labor movement, the workers' rights movement, you know, other folks who are really interested in income inequality to dig deeper and think um, about smart policy solutions to income support broadly. Um, and I think similarly, uh, you know, in five years, hopefully we'll have real standards around independent contractors and gig work and sort of the, the new economy and sort of non-traditional employment arrangements, like how we're providing protections around those um, industries feels really important. I think this pro like provides an opportunity to do that. Okay. Andy Forma? Uh, yeah, I think for me, you know, from, from somebody who's interested in health and health equity, um, I would say paid sick leave is very much high on my list of priorities uh, in terms of uh, policies that companies need to think about, and and you know just the federal government in, in general needs to think about. I think it it's not a good thing to think that you know depending on where you work or what state you live in that you might have paid sick leave versus others and who are you know equal citizens. I, I think that's just not correct. Um, so I think this is frankly a federal issue, um, paid sick leave. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, health insurance, right? Um, everybody being able to afford health insurance, everybody being able to have access to health insurance, I think it's a huge issue. Um, we, you know, we need workers and we can't have sick workers who will then spread the virus. And we can have workers who die and basically deplete, deplete the workforce. Um, so I think these are all things that are, uh, frankly, directly um, impacting the economy, um, and it's not necessarily seen as that. And I and I and I really want to raise awareness that these issues actually are directly impacting the economy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Iforma, Anma, and Rachel for, for joining us today and, and bringing up all of these, these challenges and pointing us towards some, some solutions. We've touched on some disparate trends, but they have some commonalities in that right now their impacts are really unequally distributed, but their, their impacts over the long term are also very uncertain and depend on a lot of the decisions that are made by policymakers, by employers, workers and advocates. Um, and, and all of us, as, as Congresswoman Blunt Rochester had said, it's, it's going to take all of us to come up with, with some solutions. Um, so thanks to our panelists again. Uh, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank Congressman, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester and Shamina Singh from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their remarks at the beginning of this digital event. Uh, the center is collaborating with the Aspen Institute on the Global Inclusive Growth Partnership 
which has made today's event possible. Uh, so on behalf of the Future of Work Initiative and the Financial Security Program at Aspen Institute, we look forward to continued progress on these issues and, and really appreciate everyone who took the time to listen in and ask questions. So it's sending the things to, to all of you spread out around the country and the world, uh, thinking about the future of work during and, and beyond our current crisis. So thanks again to everyone. Thank you. Bye.